This is Selma Schimmel for the Group Room at the ESMO 2012 Congress happening now in Vienna. And we are joined by Dr. Gauri Shankar Bhattacharya, head of the Department of Medical Oncology at the Fortis Hospital and assistant professor of oncology at the Chitarunda National Cancer Institute in Calcutta, India. He is also on ESMO's Developing Countries Task Force. Welcome to the Group Room. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. India is a large country, and the different regions and also uh, social status, the, the caste system that exists, how does that play into all of this? The question is the world is divided into a large number of parts. One is the parts of the haves, the other is the have-nots. Well, the have-nots are developing countries, and now I'll just try and talk about an example of what happens in a country like India, which is a big enough to be called a subcontinent. So if you're looking in terms of a subcontinent, India has got multiple states. Each state is a, almost a federal organization on its own. We are divided into 29 states, 27 languages, and nine major religions. Now, the question is running such a country as a cohesive unit under one un enforced law takes a lot of effect and a lot of effort. The reason being that you have to see that everybody is in a win-win situation. No one loses out. You're not treading on anyone's soul or anyone's foot. For example, if I put it across to you and say that when we stick to cancer and we talk about, say, a place like Jammu and Kashmir, one of the states, we have very high incidence of GI cancers. And then you move into the northeast of India, you have very high incidence of what is called nasopharyngeal and head and neck cancers. You get into the urban area of India, which is closer to the Western world, and you'll find breast cancer is extremely common among women. But if you look into the rural or the semi-rural areas, and you will see cervical cancers in women are extremely common. Now, this variegated phenomena that takes place has a lot to do with how we are approaching the nation. But I think as we start improving and start coming closer and the economic improves us, it'll be a simple platform where we'll be seeing similar what are some of the unique philosophical, uh, spiritual, and belief systems surrounding death? One of the religions that grew out and among the ancient Indian religions is called Buddhism. Lord Buddha's tenets of Buddhism actually talks about what is ethics, and possibly the whole concept of ethics is grained into the Buddhist tenet. The eight pillars of Buddhism actually forms the tenets for all ethics, whether it's clinical trials, whether it's work ethics, whether it's ethics in research or it's ethics in living. It's, that's the pillar of it. For most Indians who are Hindus and who are close to the Buddhist religion, basically, for us, death is a continuum. If you are born, one of our scriptures called Gita says, you shall die. And that's the only absolute truth. But the soul yes. lives. It's just like the soul is going to live eternally. And it's going to pass off from one body to another body like you discard your clothes. But death is never to be seen in isolation. Death is a continuum of living. So the, one of the absolute truth is that if you are born, you shall die. And that is something that we are taught right from the beginning. So there is a lot of stoicism as far as death is concerned in India. And a lot of people accept death or pain as a part of what Lord's giving them. In my opinion, the pain part is, may not be true, but death may be something that way. So we have to actually get into the part of trying to see how to control these pains. Even in the other minor religions that we have in India, like in Muslims, the Mohammedism, they also think that basically death is something which is actually a method of meeting with the maker. I asked only well, one out of interest, but also in the hope that for cancer patients that are suffering, that if there is a greater association to a life after death or meeting the maker or spiritual peace, that in some way that it eases a painful experience 
at least on a, a spiritual or emotional or existential or psychological, whatever word it is, level. I do agree with you that the whole concept of living basically is an intellectual and a psychological phenomenon. Whether you're a theist or you are a theist, whether you believe in the Lord or you don't believe in the Lord, the concept is living like ethically, which I told you is a tenant of Buddhism. If you're living ethically somewhere down the life, you're trying to look at a particular picture, then you shall be remembered by what steps you have done, integrated into the system of time. So that concept is there. Yes, we all imagine that if what we are today, tomorrow we might have something better. It can be in absolute terms, it can be in new futuristic terminologies that we can be doing better. Um, it's interesting what you say because more and more uh, in the United States, uh, people have all heard of wills, and wills usually deal with what you're going to leave behind uh, materially. But the more important will is the ethical will. What are you going to leave behind that speaks to ethics and character and humanity and the values that you want to impart to your loved ones far greater than anything monetary? And we do have a word for it now, and it is called an ethical will. And more and more people are starting to write their ethical wills. I think that's a very good step forward because that's going to be a part of advanced planning. And it's usually when you are at the uh, part of the time when you know that now it's time to say goodbye that you suddenly look back on life and say, what right, what wrong have I done and what I would like to leave behind. And that's the time when you start writing your wills. And I think one of the wills I think will be very, very important because I think a lot of things has gone wrong with the world right now is the lack of ethics. So we could probably go on talking and talking and talking. It's been a fascinating interview with you, Dr. Gauri Shankar Bhattacharya. And now I'd love to hear you say it. Gauri Shankar Bhattacharya. And then I just want to tell you something. Calcutta is a name that's very oftenly used, but on today's date we call it Kolkata. What led to the change? Uh, the change has just been in trying to get back to the original niti of the place, which grew out of two villages, which went conjoined from the word Kolkata. And when did they begin this name change? This is roughly about now 15 years back. We even got some history education here too. It's really been amazing, everything we've discussed with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody.